Good morning. I want to say happy Pentecost. I don't know if I've ever said that before, but today is Pentecost and we're celebrating the, the gift of the Holy Spirit being uh, poured out upon uh, all of God's believers. So it's a special day. That's why we have the red. Uh, I want to start out by saying a, a big thank you to uh, uh, all the men who came out yesterday and did all the landscaping and also all of the carrying out we had an antiques here. I'm almost hoping that wherever some of those antique computers and everything went, they'll consider taking them to a museum. I mean, we got rid of a lot, a lot of stuff here. And uh, I want to just thank everyone for, for all that uh, help in, in doing that. Also, uh, we, our, our leadership is working on, on a, a, what to do with the change in the COVID laws, regulations, whatever they are, by the government. From what I understand, I think June 2nd is supposed to be. And I'll tell you, personally and partly, we can look at it from a legal aspect and everything, and that's great. By the way, I want to really thank, I'll say his name, Jeff Gamble, because, no, really, you've been legal counsel to the whole congregation through this whole thing. A real big help it gives a lot of uh, confidence and peace in knowing that you know uh, we're doing our very best to follow the guidelines and everything else. But it's it's what I would like to say as a pastor is even though things might miraculously change overnight on June second, I don't know what day of the week is that. It's a Tuesday. Yeah, I don't, it just seems to my mind, I get confused and I think, how can everything change all of a sudden? And why I'm saying that is because I think we have to allow for confusion for a lot of us for quite a while. So this is what I want to advise. Whether they say you can or can't, whatever the rules are for the mask, if you feel more comfortable with social distancing and with masks on, you continue to wear masks and social distance. Uh, I want you all to just do what, whatever is most comfortable. Be led by the Holy Spirit in this, too, uh, uh, as we go. But I, I, I think, from a pastoral point of view, that we're going to be dealing with this kind of psychologically probably for the next, th throughout the summer, in other words, until even if they say at penalty of law, if you wear a mask, we're going to kill you or something, a lot of us are going to still be used to wearing masks and so on. That's okay. But I want you to know that we have very capable people working at all the policies. And as a pastor, I want you to feel comfortable however we do it. But one thing I do want to say, and maybe if you have some divine inspiration ideas. We'd like to speed up communion uh, because, uh, and I thank you for your patience, but it's been kind of painfully slow uh, over this last year. Thank God we've been able to do it. Uh, but I, I, I've been talking to some of our leadership too, and it just may be that if we have a table that goes from there to there, and we have two single people in line that uh, one could go one and one the other and have social distancing and everything else and uh, so on. Oh, I shouldn't have do this. See, I, when I, my mind just goes crazy. But uh, we're going to have a million-dollar lottery here for the biggest families who can come together to the table at once. And I know who that is right now, but you might be able to work on that if you get some extended... <laughs> So you step, fail. no, I'm just kidding. But I really, I did tell Stephen, I think it was last. Uh, I said, when I see your family come into church, I get so excited on a communion Sunday because I know that whole row is going to come up to the front. Anyway, sorry for going off, but COVID things changing. I we want you to be comfortable, uh, and we don't want to uh, put a scarlet letter on anyone. Uh, either. Okay. 
After the worship service, we're going to go to the next episode of, uh, episode of Chosen and time uh, permitting maybe some Bible study after that too. But that series is really great. And I want to encourage you, even if you haven't been able to come to the Bible study, you can go on the internet and you can get the free movies and you can watch them. They are just fantastic. And uh, one other announcement, well, let me, a couple prayer things. <sighs> Little Maria has successfully received her heart and liver transplant. You can imagine what a delicate procedure this is, so I want you all to continue to pray for her. Uh, as uh, she, she had a little bit of a fever, I guess, last night, uh, it's a miracle, it really is, uh, what God's given brains and his creation to do with transplanting organs. It all worked out, but let's continue to pray for her and also for her family, especially Tom and Sandy. They have been under so much stress for so long. I, I can't even imagine it. And we've bore your burdens with you. A lot of us, have been, <laughs> maybe it's not a faith statement, but we've been stressed with you really praying for uh, Marie and for you and, and all of the family. And one final, uh, oh, and uh, Phyllis Stewart uh, is in hospice. And uh, my wife and I were able to visit her, served her communion, and frankly, she seemed better than she had been the last couple times I saw her. You just never know. But she is in hospice, and uh, she really appreciates, she told me how many of you also contact her and have visited her too. And one last uh, just detail, uh, next week, uh, midweek, I'll be in uh, a, for a continuing education uh, conference uh, in Michigan. Uh, so I will not be able to lead the, the Thursday morning uh, Bible study because that is that will be right in the uh, middle of, of the presentation. So with that, I do say again, happy Pentecost. It's something to really rejoice about, the gift of the Holy Spirit. And uh, we are going to uh, begin this morning with uh, Psalm 139. And I ask you to please stand. Our reading for this morning comes from Psalm 139, verses 1 through 12. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You search out my path. You search out my path, and my lying down are acquainted with all my ways. You hem me in behind and before, and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is I. I cannot attain it. Where shall I go from your spirit? Or, well sh or where shall I flee from your presence? I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light about me be night. Even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day, for the darkness is as light with you.
please remain standing and turn with me to page 184. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. Almighty God, our Maker and Redeemer, we poor sinners confess unto you that we are by nature sinful and unclean, and that we have sinned against you by thought, word, and deed. Wherefore, we flee for refuge to your infinite mercy, seeking and imploring your grace for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. O most merciful God, who has given your only begotten Son to die for us, have mercy upon us. And for his sake, grant us remission of all our sins. And by your Holy Spirit, increase in us true knowledge of you and of your will and true obedience to your word, to the end that by your grace we may come to everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, has had mercy upon us and has given his only Son to die for us, and for his sake forgives us all our sins. To those who believe on his name, he gives power to become the children of God, and has promised them his Holy Spirit. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Grant this, Lord, unto us all. The Lord be with you. Heavenly Father, on this day we remember the words of your Son that said, Abide in me, and I in you. 
And Lord, we give you thanks and praise that through his blood shed for us and his ascension at your right hand in heaven, you have now sent the Holy Spirit so you, O Lord, abide in us. Lord, open our eyes to see you and to worship you, we pray in Jesus' name. And please be seated. Our Old Testament reading for this morning comes from the book of Ezekiel, chapter 37, verses 1 through 14. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. And he led me around among them, and behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley, and behold, they were very dry. And then he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, prophesy over these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, behold, I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you and will cause flesh to come upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live, and you shall know that I am Lord. So I prophesied as, as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a sound, and behold, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. And then I looked, and behold, there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, Prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, Our bones are dried up, and our hope is lost. We are indeed cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus said the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and raise you from my graves, O my people. I will put, you, put my spirit within you, and you shall live, and I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I am the Lord, that I have spoken, and I, will do, and I will do it, declares the Lord. This is the word of the Lord.
Our epistle reading for this morning comes from the book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 1 through 21. And when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a, a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under its heaven. And at this sound the multitude came together, and they were be bewildered, because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all those who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native tongue? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But the others mocking said, they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it's the only the third hour of the day. But this was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male and female servants in those days I'll pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire, and vapors of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood. Before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magn magnificent day, and it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 15th and 16th chapters. But when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. And you will also bear witness, because you have been with me from the beginning. But I have said these things to you, that when the hour comes, you may remember that I told them to you. I did not say these things to you from the beginning, because I was with you. But now I'm going to him who sent me, and none of you asks me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness. Because I go to the Father, and you will see me no longer. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide to you in all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will declare to you things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. This is the gospel of the Lord.
I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was made incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. On the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. Starting in John chapter 14, and you can look more throughout the Gospel of John, but specifically, Jesus starts talking about the Holy Spirit who would come. And he says this in John chapter 14, If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, the spirit of truth. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. 
Sometimes the Bible is written like a journal, like the book of Acts. These are the things that happened. Luke, as he pours out the the story, the, the account of Jesus, he's not saying you need to make a theology of everything that happens. On the contrary, here is the working of the Holy Spirit and and the experience of people empowered by the Holy Spirit, filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, But here in John, Jesus is actually teaching theologically about the Holy Spirit. I, uh, well, I, I had a, raised up in a Lutheran church, fell dramatically away. Sometimes when you get really deep in the darkness, the light looks really bright. I mean, it just does. And I had a very exciting uh, transformation that happened in my life. And uh, like Aaron here, I went off to seminary. And uh, I don't recommend professors necessarily doing this, but there we are sitting in a class. I don't even think it was a preaching class. He's saying, well, I'm just going to come up with a word, and I want you to do a five- or seven-minute sermon on the word. Don't they know that for most people, getting up and speaking in front of people is one of the scariest things that people ever do? And on top of that, you want to be prepared if you're a rookie and a beginner. So I sat there, and uh, like an answer to prayer, he, he pointed at me and said, Tony Sobosinski, Pentecost. And man, you couldn't have lit a fuse. I had experienced the joy of the Holy Spirit in my life. It's, well, let me put it this way. I was just saying, you know, it says, Jesus says, the wind blows where it will. You can see the results. You can see trees bowing over. You can see leaves swirling, being blown, but you can't see the wind. So it is with the Holy Spirit. But what we don't see, because in Greek and, and in Hebrew, uh, the word for wind, the word for breath, the word for spirit are all the same word. And to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit when you've been in darkness, it's like being someone who has asthma that cannot catch their breath they're slowly suffocating. And that oxygen is not getting to their body and they're getting exhausted. And then all of a sudden you get the cool, fresh air pour into your lungs and you can breathe again. He breathes his life into us. In the Ezekiel passage, uh, he says, uh, Son of man, prophesy to these bones, and so on. And I've, uh, I've thought about this while I was looking at that passage and thinking about the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. I mean, what if you put a little bit of that thought into it as you say those words that God told you to pray, that he taught you to pray, and it's more than just saying words, but it's almost like prophesying. May your name be hallowed. And there's something with the Holy Spirit accompanying all of our prayers that God is going to bring this to life and make it come to pass. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Well, here in John chapter 14 through 16, just to walk through that with you, it says, he will give you another counselor. This is not like a therapist. Don't get me wrong, God is a very good therapist, okay? (laughs) The Holy Spirit does. And it's uh, another one of the versions says comforter. God is the God of all comfort, but that's not what the word means here. It's a legal term. It's like a legal advocate. Someone that comes forth for your defense. I remember, maybe I shouldn't, well, I've been praying, Holy Spirit would leave me, so I'm just going to anyway. There was a time that some new people came into the church, and the next thing I knew is they were trying to sue me, a pastor close by, and the district 
for a million dollars a piece. And I thought, what in the world are they going to accuse me of? And uh, frankly, when I found out it was uh, what they said was breaking a confidence instead of some kind of a sexual accusation that was a lie, I was actually relieved. But we had to meet right here in Dayton at a law office, lawyers for this, and one of the, the lawyers for the other side, he was known as a priest killer. He would go out through all the areas where every accusation that came against a priest, he'd just eliminate those priests right from the ministry. And I also had a legal counsel advocate for me. And I can still remember uh, that day clearly. And uh, actually someone in the congregation came through and said, is it supposed to be about a breaking of confidence and losing a job? Uh, I remember one of you came through and said, Pastor, we knew about that before you even heard about it because this person was sharing this as a prayer request and we were collecting money. So you weren't breaking a confidence and that's all I needed. I came with that and totally absolved. But we had legal counsel advocates from our congregation. We had them from the district. And thank God we were defended. That, that is the word here. Matter of fact, 1 John chapter 2, it says, My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father. Same word. And I don't care what version you go to, except for the NIV, and I'll tell you what that one is. They all use the word advocate. But when back in John, the same word, they talk about a counselor. Well, maybe you think about legal counsel. I think about someone who is advising me, not legally, but just as the comforter, if you will. But they all translate advocate, except the NIV, one who speaks to the Father in our defense. And it's a beautiful message that Jesus is telling us. He's saying, I'm going to send you one who is going to speak to the Father in your defense. And by the way, we got the Holy Trinity here working, so Jesus is identifying himself in 1 John chapter 2. But he says, I will send another like me. I will not leave you orphans. I will not abandon you. I will be there. And that's through the gift of the Holy Spirit. And he is the one, I don't believe Satan can do this anymore, but one time he was standing before God in heaven when Job uh, was a righteous man. He was accusing him and trying to tear him apart. But Satan will try to break you down. Satan can try to bring false accusations against you to make you feel like you are a sinner. And guess what? That's a good strategy because it's true. You and I have sinned. We are not perfect. But the Holy Spirit is there sent by Jesus to say, yeah, that's true. This child of mine has sinned, but guess what? I died on the cross and shed my blood, and they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. And that testimony is more than just witnessing for Jesus. It's actually a legal defense word, the testimony of truth that we give, because he is the spirit of truth. So I was looking up, and I know I heard these different terms as far as lawyers and everything, but it, on the internet, so it's got to be true. A lawyer is a general term used to describe a legal professional who has attended law school and obtained a Bachelor of Law degree. An advocate, they say, is a specialist in law and can represent clients in court. And it is so helpful to know another example. I, my son uh, is trying to look for, what a time to look for a house. But we're praying for him. It's one of the worst times to try to buy a house, I think, in history, just about. The prices are just skyrocketing. So I just had a thought, and I said, I'm going to call up the the man I know that knows about law, and say, would you talk to my son? And he had already put a bid 
offer on a house. And they, they pulled it away. And I think it's because they knew that he wasn't just a defenseless sheep that could be taken by them because they heard some big problems with their property. But on the contrary, he had an advocate, a lawyer, putting things into words. And they just got away from him as fast as they could. Also, I looked up, it says, the word legal counsel is interchangeably used with the title of lawyer. When I was in uh, British Columbia just before I came here, uh, I was starting up a congregation in a town. Somehow I had the privilege and honor of being asked to serve on a, a community board. And the board included two of the local uh, city's mayors, uh, I as a pastor. There were some other people with expertise in working with juvenile delinquency, basically. And there was a lawyer, and I can't remember how the joke went, but when he was being introduced, he said, uh, yeah, people say that I'm a good lawyer if there's such a thing. And it is an exception when we can find a Christian lawyer, but this goes better than this, saying the Holy Spirit is your lawyer, the God of the universe who knows everything. He is representing you. And he is there to defend you as the legal represent your advocate. So this word, but the counselor, still in chapter 14, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I have said to you. And that's the beauty of how the Holy Spirit works. Jesus continues to teach you and I through the Holy Spirit. Jesus says he takes what is mine and gives it to you. So the Holy Spirit is a teacher of the truth. He helps you understand the very word of God and things about the kingdom of God. And on top of that, it says he will remind you of everything I have said to you. That was especially important for the writers of the Gospels because they had to remember everything inspired by the Holy Spirit to write it down. In chapter 15, that starts with abide in me and I in you. But later in that chapter, verse 26, Jesus says, when the advocate, the counselor comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. And that goes many ways. He will testify in our hearts that Jesus is the Son of God, our Savior, but he will also testify to the world out there who does not know him yet that this Jesus is God the Son. And then we get to John 16, which we heard read earlier. It says the counselor, or this, our heavenly legal advocate, will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. You know, there are different levels of sin, I mean, it's like every sin will get you convicted. But there are greater sins. Jesus talked about it. Matter of fact, in, in Psalm 19, we looked at that. Uh, you know, protect me from being invo uh, involved in great transgressions. But what would you say you would think is the greatest sin that you could ever do before God? What would offend God the Father more than any other? Well, Jesus tells us. He says, the Holy Spirit, our heavenly legal advocate, will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness. And he says in verse 9, in regard to sin, because men do not believe in me. And think about this. This is God, the creator of heaven and earth. You have sinned and are part of a fallen race, helplessly separated from God. But God the Father loves you so much that he sends his son with the sole purpose of going on the cross and dying for you, paying for your sins, suffering and rising from the dead and enduring what it was like to be a human being for those years. 
And God says, here's my gift. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And you say, I'm not interested. I don't need your son. I don't want what he did for me. And I would just soon not get too religious with you, God. It's like spitting in the face of God to not believe and receive. In John chapter 1, it says, To many as received him, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. And we're born again, according to John chapter 3, by the power of the Holy Spirit. We're born from above. And he goes on to say, in regard to righteousness, because I'm going to the Father. They were saying that he was demon-possessed, that he was evil, he needed to be killed. But his righteousness would be revealed as he ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And he says, in regard of judgment, because the prince of this world, that's Satan, now stands condemned. Praise God. He has been condemned. Jesus has done it. And it's just a matter of time before those of you who have been on Thursday morning or Thursday morning uh, Bible study on, online, we've been studying the book of Revelation. We're at the last chapters. And it tells the victory of what's going to happen. So Jesus says this in, beginning in verse 12. I have much more to say to you more than you can now bear. You know, we can only ha handle so much at a time. Hebrew is a class that I, I have on every Friday. And uh, I can almost, and I, I joke with Roger about it, but I'll just say, because something come up for discussion so that we avoid starting the actual Hebrew. We're reading through the book of Genesis right now. And I'm the one reading it. <laughs> and he's checking me as I do it out loud. So I'll come up with a conversation and I'll joke with him. I'll say, well, my brain just doesn't want to really get started. So it's trying to find ways around it so that we can waste time. So I won't have as much I have to concentrate on Hebrew. But it always seems like at the end of that hour, it, it uh, my brain gets so intense. You might as well not go any farther. Your brain is exhausted. It's done. You can hardly focus and walk out of the room. It gets so, which is really good for your brain. But Jesus says, for you, as you are learning about Jesus and about the kingdom of God, he's saying, I still have a lot more to say to you. I have a lot more that I want you to learn and know and realize about the kingdom of God. But it's more than you can bear now. And as a loving father and our instructor, he takes us step by step as much as we can bear. And this was important because Jesus is at the end of his physical teaching life. Well, except after he rose from the dead, he talked about the kingdom of God for 40 days with them. But still, he's saying, there's more I want you to remember to learn, to know. He says, I can't finish that off with you right now because it's more than you can bear. But verse 13 says, but when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. Remember, on the day of Pentecost, there was no New Testament. When Jesus taught, there was no New Testament. There was the Hebrew Scriptures that we call the Old Testament. That was the Bible. And so God had a task. He had to inspire believers to be able to remember and accurately put down every detail of teaching, of doctrine, of the account of Jesus and his life, all the points to edit through it, what was uh, essential and important, what other things could be left out because, as John says at the end, if all the, it was said about Jesus, it would be more than all the libraries of the world could handle. So the Holy Spirit would take these apostles, the ones who were going to be the ones who would write down these letters and these gospels, 
And the Holy Spirit's purpose and job, if you will, was to make sure that we had truth. He is the spirit of truth. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and in all of the books of the New Testament now, they were to be inspired into the future so that we would have this word. He will guide you into all truth. That still applies for you and me, but specifically those who wrote the books of the Bible. And he guides us into all truth through what they wrote. The reason why you who are filled with the Holy Spirit can pick up your Bibles, and I, I did, I saw, a, I just stumbled on different people have different kinds of channels, and they'll kind of blog of their own lives, you know? Well, this just happened to be a, a Christian, and uh, she was explaining how uh, when the Holy Spirit really filled her. She explained it like a scan. When people prayed over her, it was like a cleansing effect, like being immersed right from the top of her head, right down to her feet. And she said the change was she was a little shy of still telling, because she had a lot of family and friends who, uh, well, they weren't born again, spirit-filled believers. So uh, she would go for a ride in her car and then she'd sit in a parking lot for like at four hours at a time reading the Bible. And she couldn't get enough. That's the Holy Spirit working through here. So Jesus said, I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. And he will tell you what is yet to come. I mean, the beautiful thing is, as you ask for guidance in your life, he knows what is going to come. And if he doesn't, and I wouldn't want, I mean, who am I to advise God? But there is a sense, I really don't want to know everything that is to come. I mean, would you want to know right now the day of your death or whatever? I would just assume God uses wisdom on what he reveals. But since he knows the future is you pray about different things, about your future, where you're going, what he wants to do with your life. He knows what is yet to come. And when it's necessary, he will warn you and prepare you and guide you into that future. And finally, in this teaching parts we're looking at, it says, Jesus says, he will bring glory to me by taking from what is mine and making it known to you. And the beautiful work of the Holy Spirit is that as Jesus sent him, he glorifies Jesus, the Son of God. And he takes what Jesus wants to say to us and brings it to us. So before we pray, the prayer which comes from Psalm 51, created me a clean heart, that's on page 192. I want to close this part of the message off with, with prayer. Father, we do thank you so much for the gift of the Holy Spirit. Lord, we pray that you would examine our hearts and show, convict us of sin where we are guilty of holding you back and keeping you at arm's length away. Lord, we pray for your forgiveness and we pray that in spite of that, you would soften our hearts You would make our hearts on fire for you. Like those disciples on the Emmaus Road when they said, didn't his words just burn in our hearts when he spoke to us about the scriptures? Father, help us to open ourselves entirely to you. Spirit of God, breathe upon us. Breathe your life from heaven into us. Glorify Jesus, we pray. In the name of the Son of God, we pray. Amen.
And if you're able, please stand with us as we pray. Father, we praise you and we worship you. You, you just changed this world and this universe when you poured out your Holy Spirit on that day of Pentecost. Father, pour out your Spirit upon each one of us. Lord, use us for your glory. Help us to be your witnesses, to testify on your behalf. Lord, Spirit of God, we thank you that you are our legal advocate before the throne of the Father. And you also convict the world of sin. Lord, we know that your desire is that everyone in the world would come to you and come to faith in your Son and receive your Spirit. So, Lord, where our hearts have become hardened, Lord, break them for you. Convict our hearts and our minds by your Holy Spirit so that we will come running to Jesus for forgiveness and refreshing and life from above. Heavenly Father, we, we want to continue to pray for those who uh, have been physically ill. We especially give you thanks for little Maria. She now has a new heart. She has a new liver. And Lord, we pray that by your miraculous holy touch that you would help her body accept and for this heart and liver to just become part of and to heal up. And Lord, help her to be able to get healthier and healthier, come out of that hospital. We pray that you would help her to live a normal, healthy life for your glory. And Lord, mostly we thank you for her childlike faith that she has in you. And Lord, we pray for uh, Phyllis. Lord, thank you for the faith you have given her. We pray for her, for your will to be done. And we thank you that you've already done miracles of healing in, in her life. But Lord, we pray especially that you would bless her heart with all her loved ones and with your love continue to be with her and abide in her uh, as she right now is in, in the hospice. Father, we pray for those who just can't get out. We especially pray for Ruth, Dave, Helen and Mindy, for Jean, Ed and Rosemary, Herman and Ruth, Rita and Pam, Charlotte. Father, we pray for Barbara, Tracy, and Lord, all of our congregation, all of our extended family. We thank you so much for your care, your faithfulness, your protection in making us distinct, being under your protective hand. Father, we continue to pray for the world around us. We know that in the scriptures, it just says in the last days, things are going to get bad. But also, Lord, it's a time for the light of your gospel to shine strongly and many to be able to escape the, the, the damnation of this world that will be coming and the judgment of the prince of this world. Lord, we hear your words to say, come out from her. Come out from among this Babylon the great and to come to you. So Lord, now we pray that by your Holy Spirit, call us to come to you in every way with our lives. We continue to pray that you will just eliminate this ugly plague that has been upon our world. Give us wisdom on how to go forward in every way. We pray for our government, all those who have been elected. And we pray this in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. So I ask you to please stand for uh, hymn number 501. And after the hymn, if you would be seated so that the ushers can usher you out. But before we sing that hymn, please receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.